let's get started. So this is a dynamic duo. This is part one. We're going to do part two because there really is a lot to talk about um, and a lot of different activities that you can do. So I try to include you know, information and activities because I think as teachers, we need to understand what we're doing and then we need things to do. <laughs> so um, hopefully you'll find something in here that, that you can use. So first, let's talk about the English code. Um, every you know, writing system is a code, every language is a code. And uh, if you, you know, know how to decode, right, you can read it. And if you know how to encode, you can spell it. So the English code com consists of 44 sounds. So there really was not a consensus on how many sounds <laughs> there was in our language until recently. So you probably will see a lot of things where it ranges from like 41 to 46. And um, I think dialect has a lot to do with that and what, you know, people kind of, you know, split some similar sounds. But in general, there's about 44 sounds. There's 26 letters. Everyone is pretty much in agreement on those. And there are 89 main graphemes. So graphemes are the way we spell our sounds. Now there's 200 others, and that number also varies by opinion because some people separate out some letters as a different sound, some people put them together, and, um, and honestly, depending on, on accent and, uh, you know, it could be British English or American English or Australian English, and they all are slightly different. Right. So uh, if you are a person that wants a definitive answer, you need to speak another language. <laughs> so, but we take those 44 sounds, those 26 letters and those, you know, 289 graphemes and we can make a million words. Now, luckily we don't need to know how to read and spell a million words. So in uh, our oral language, not spelling, because that is a, a different thing, the average student starting school knows between 500 and 6,000 words. You know, so, you know, when we're talking about kids who, you know, have more than 6,000 words, they're probably, um, you know, pretty exposed and, and highly language oriented. So, but there is a, a big difference between 500 and 6,000. So, uh, and you probably have seen that in your classroom if you teach the lower grades. The average high school student knows about 45,000 words. And a college graduate knows 75,000 or so words. So um, in order to be successful at college, I've seen, you know, varying numbers, but they'd say you have to have about 60,000 words in your oral vocabulary in order to be successful entering into college, because the volume of words that you're going to be exposed to, if you don't have, you know, a, a pretty large, you know, lexicon, then you are going to have to put in and an inordinate amount of work to try to keep up. So um, we want to make sure kids have exposure to as many you know, words in our oral language as possible. And then it would be great if they could also spell them, right? So um, we don't need to spell things that don't have meaning to us. So if we don't know the words, we won't want to spell them because uh, you know, I, I've challenged my kids before. I would, I've said to them, I'll give you $100 if you can spell a word you don't know. <laughs> and they find out pretty quickly that they're not going to be able to spell it because they will know it <laughs> if they tell me. <laughs> if they say, like, I know this word and I can spell it. Well, too late, right? You already lose. Um, so let's talk about phonological awareness. So phonological awareness is the ability to hear and manipulate sounds in oral language. So there is a continuum, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. But if you have trouble with phonological awareness, you're gonna also have trouble acquiring vocabulary. So it's hard, harder for kids to discriminate the different sounds within words, to attach a meaning to words correctly um, if they have auditory discrimination issues or like, let's say they um, need tubes in their ears or they have uh, you know, all kinds of, of different types of difficulties can happen for, for speech and for hearing. Um, that will impact your phonological awareness at a, at a young age, right? So we also um, focus mainly in education on phonemic awareness. So phonological awareness is, you know, can consist of lots of different skills, but in the classroom, we're really focusing on phonemic awareness, which falls under phonological awareness, 
and um, but it is identifying individual speech sounds okay and those speech sounds are called phonemes so that's why i have the slash there if you're not familiar with the term phoneme it is an individual speech sound and we will go over that again phonics is actually just pairing a sound with a symbol so if i if i hear i need to know that i can pair that with a p so that's how you would figure out how to spell a word that you already know right so this is just an example of the three like three things we really need to know about words when we're looking at them and those are a morpheme which is the unit of meaning right because we're not going to try to spell a word that we don't know right when kids want to write a sentence um they use words they know they may be wrong about knowing the word but they think they know what the word means uh or you wouldn't be able to put a sentence together right so the phoneme is the single speech sound and the graphene is is the single is the spelling of that single speech sound. So it you know a, a grapheme can have more than one letter, but it's going to represent one sound. So the phonemes and the graphemes will always be in alignment. It doesn't mean the number of letters are going to be in alignment. So that's why I have used the word page because the word page you know has a meaning as a word, and it can you know you know different parts of speech and that type of thing. But let's just say like the word page has one meaning, and um, and so it has three phonemes, the P, A, J, and the J is spelled with the G, E. So when we look at the graphemes, even though we hear the J sound like a, a J, um, when we go to spell it, we would have to remember a rule that words in English don't end in J, and we're going to have to use a G, E, and that E is going to do double duty for phonics, that it's going to make that A you know, say its name, and it's going to allow that G to sound like a J. So we have to be thinking about a lot of different things while we're decoding and encoding words, right? Um, like in the word never, there's actually two morphemes in the word never. So, you know, people tend to think that morphemes are just like a prefix or a suffix, um, but in the word never, it's basically not ever, you know? So you will, you jump out of an airplane, if anyone ever asked me that, I would say not ever, <laughs> which is never, right? So that ever, it's the same um, meaning as like either, if you put an N in front of it, neither, you know, I, do you want either one? No, I want neither, not either. Um, the phoneme that's, you know, single speech sound is still, there's just one sound in that N, even though there's two meanings, right? In that two morphemes that give us the meaning to the word never. And then the graphemes. So, you know, things can, you know, get more difficult, but I just wanted to show you a couple of, of examples of those two. All right. So let's talk about the phonological awareness continuum. So a lot of time should be spent in preschool on things like rhyming, um, making sure that they can um, rhyme hat, mat, pat, uh, without even worrying about reading right we just want them to be able to hear the difference in the sounds we want them to be able to listen to like dr seuss or all kinds of different rhyming books and uh be able to put in the next word that should rhyme with the last word of the last line and so if kids can do that and they've been read to and they they understand the concept of rhyme it's a very very good predictor that the rest of phonological awareness continuum will kind of fall into place now there are a lot of kids that don't actually um, do really well in rhyme when they're young. And so, you know, the consensus right now is, is that you don't have to master rhyme to get started with reading, right? So it used to be that everybody thought that you had to, you know, be able to rhyme before you could to learn how to read. You can actually kind of keep moving without hitting that, that benchmark because you can continue to weave it in later. Now, rhyming is still important because rhyme is going to help you with recognizing suffixes and that they're similar, and it's gonna help you with recognizing accenting later so that if you can't write rhyme cat, hat, mat when you're three, uh, we might need to work on some things later when you're making sure that you can hear that invisible and divisible have the same ending, that they sound similar that it's not divisively, right? So that we make sure the accenting um, and we can inflect. It's, there's a lot of that linked back to the ability to, to detect rhyme. Um, 
And so that's our morphological awareness. So even though the rest of these things kind of come in um, naturally, um, as we move through with, with most kids, sometimes rhyme um, stays a little bit further behind. Okay. Now, phonemic awareness is kind of the, you know, top of that continuum. There's other things with, you know, moving words around. I like pizza. I like bananas. I can substitute all of those um, words and I can substitute syllables. You know, I'm, I'm running, I'm listening. They can kind of hear that the ing stayed the same. Um, and so remember all these things are, if they're phonemic and phonological, they're all auditory. So we're not looking at the letters. We are just listening for the sounds so that we can auditorily discriminate them. And, and that's why oral language is so important. When I talked about how many words, you know, coming in, you know, 500 to 6,000 words coming into, you know, school doesn't mean you can spell 500 to 6,000 words, but if you know them, the more words that you know, orally the more words you're going to recognize when you start learning phonics, when you start learning the code and you're decoding, you're gonna go, oh, I, I've heard that before. I've recognized that word. Um, and I can you know, move some of the sounds around to see which way it sounds best, right? So if you've ever had kids read like produce and then they go back and go produce or conduct and conduct. So if they know what the words mean, then they'll go back and, and adjust them accordingly. So in the phonemic awareness, um, continuum. We've got manipulating sounds, so pat to hat to mat, right? Segmenting words into sounds where we can say how many sounds are in pat and they can pull those apart, blending sounds into words, um, and, then, and then deleting sounds. So when we're doing all of these things, we want to, you know, make sure that kids can uh, hold all of these in their working memory, that they can manipulate them, and it's going to impact their ability to read spell, but most importantly, it's gonna impact their vocabulary. And we want them to have these skills so that when they can learn to manipulate sounds, they will eventually transfer that to manipulating morphemes so that they can hear, you know, that a prefix changed, that a suffix changed, that the base in the middle, you know, if I have respect, that that's the same thing as inspect, right? So to see some, inspecting, I'm looking in, I'm, I'm investigating, right? Respect is, is more to see again. I see you um, in a different light and with, you know, usually respect means you have good thoughts about them. Um, so we have phonemic awareness and phonemes and graphemes, right? So um, we can be working on multiple activities under phonemic awareness, but we still are going to be pairing our phonemes and our graphemes so that we have that phoneme grapheme correspondence, which is the alphabetic principle, depending on you know where you're trained, um, and is phonics. So phonics is is really just taking the sound and having some way to represent it on paper so that you don't forget what you what happened yesterday. Right? So during, you know, during prehistoric times, people were like, what was that story? I don't know. I don't remember. Maybe we should find a system to write it down. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, written language evolved. All right. So traditionally we talk about, you know, if it's phonological awareness and it, or phonemic awareness that we're not supposed to have a letter present. Now that is the big kind of confusion right now where there are some programs that just do phonemic awareness and they're not linked at all to uh, the phonics that's, that, that are being taught at that time. And so what the research is saying is that if you're doing a phonemic awareness activity, then it should be paired with the phonics. So um, luckily that's the way I've been doing it. So I'm happy, but uh, I'm always holding my breath when new research comes out. <laughs> so that, like, oh, please. I don't want to have been ruining kids for the last 20 years. Um, but basically what they're saying is you can do phonemic awareness activities, but sometimes the people are doing phonemic awareness activities and they have nothing to do with what concepts are actually being taught. So that's really what people are talking about now about combining the phonemic awareness with phonics. So if I were working on the sounds and mm -hmm, then I would talk about all these picture cards where we've got a fairy and fire and a flag and a vest and a base and talk about the vocabulary 
and say, okay, where can we sort these? Which one starts with, and which one starts with V? But I can also include that letter. So if you see at the top of my balloons, I have an F and a V, and this is just a, um, a Google Doc and a, a PowerPoint that I have that I let the students drag and sort them into the right column, whether it's a quiet sound or loud sound that is quiet, the v is loud. So what we're teaching is not only phonemic awareness because we've got the initial sound and we're sorting it, but we're also pairing it with the symbol. We're letting them look at that F and that V and this is where we're sorting it. So we're not, um, we're not hiding the symbols. So a lot of times traditionally, we've been told if it is a phonological awareness activity that it has to be, no, there has to be no letters present. And so what, what really is being said is that you can do both. So you can say, okay, let's talk about, do you hear the sound in flag, but maybe not show them the letter yet. And that is a, is a phonological awareness activity that could precede teaching the letter F. And then once you've taught the letter F, the, the research shows that when you have these two together, that kids move a lot faster. So if we have, and I was refreshing my memory before tonight, as so I'm reading a meta-analysis on this, just to make sure I was not making stuff up. So, um, which I don't think I really do, but you know, you never know. So rereading it today, I was like, yep, that's what it means. So we wanna make sure that we are getting the, most bang for our buck. So it's not saying that doing phonological awareness activities, you know, separate and that don't have anything to do with what you're covering um, aren't, you know, somewhat beneficial. But if you want maximum effect, you're going to want to match it with the concepts that you're teaching at that time, right? So you don't always want the letter present because then that is purely phonics and that's all it is. But here, if I have picture cards, they have to know what these are. So it's a little bit about vocabulary because I have a lot of kids who look at some of these things and they're like, what's that? <laughs> I'm like, it's a vacuum. <laughs> and they're like, never seen that in my life. And those were my children. No, I'm kidding. Um, they might have seen one. Uh, <laughs> hopefully they've seen one. <laughs> but, but that's where, you know, you're teaching vocabulary. You're listening for that initial sound, which is the easiest for kids um, to start with. Initial sound, then final sound, then medial sound. Um, and they're getting the phonics and phonological awareness practice. Okay, I like this activity. I have kids, um, you know, cut out pictures and then I want them to tell me how many um, sounds are in this picture. So I'm not asking them to spell it, right? I'm just asking them to listen for the sounds. So if they're listening for the sounds, then they should draw two lines because that means that it is now fish. There, that fish has been divided into three parts, right? So now, if when I can, when I look at what they've done, I can say without them spelling it, because I'm not asking them necessarily to spell sounds, because I may not have taught them. But can they tell me how many sounds are in that word, right? So this is also my favorite joke. <laughs> What's a fish with no eyes? It. Okay. Anyway, phonics jokes. Um, so now what if, what if the kid says, oh, that's a flounder? Because that's something you're going to have to be, uh, be aware of. They might cut something out and you're like, oh, that's a fish. And they're like, no, it's, it's a flounder, which is a you know type of fish. Or they might say, oh, that's a pet or who knows what they're, what they're going to call it. Um, or they might go purple. That's the word they're dividing when they look at this, but you, you will have to ask them what is this? And then make sure that the sounds are correctly labeled in it. Because if this, if they say flounder, then they need to have, you know, l, ow, n, d, and er, right? And that is how many sounds would be in flounder. I always have them draw their lines from left to right. That way they are, you know, paying attention to the phonemes as they go through the picture. So, I mean, it could be a cat and they're like at, which means there'd be two lines, you know, going through so that it divides it into three um, phonemes, right? And so this is a good activity. They could do it where they, you know, cut out pictures from coloring books or 
uh, magazines, whatever you have laying around, they can draw them, you know, draw a bunch of things that start with, and then the next day you're gonna say, okay, now I want you to draw the lines and see if you can count how many sounds are in them. I ask a lot of my kids to cut them and in strips and then we glue them down. Uh, but if they accidentally cut too many strips, they can sometimes get a little upset. <laughs> So, so it just depends on the kids you have doing this and what their ages are. Now, I did this in high school as well, but I made them pick, you know, longer words or, um, you know, three syllable words and then chop it into its phonemes. So they had to go, you know, look through magazines and be like chandelier. Oh, I can use that. And then they had to cut it into the phonemes so that I was making it more difficult, even though um, they were older they still had a hard time listening for sounds within words, breaking them down and spelling. A lot of them would just guess. And so they'd write it down, a lot of letters in the middle um, that did not line up with sounds just because they were trying to memorize it. And, and this way it helps them to stop, think about all the sounds that are in the word and um, they're practicing what they're gonna need when they start learning all the letters and, and you know, other graphemes that are the representation of those sounds. Okay, so phoneme to grapheme mapping. So when you're doing this, what you're doing is um, listening for the sound, right? So we're, and then we're gonna immediately do phonics with it, right? And that's what the research is saying is, is what, you should, what you should do. So if I was dictating the word bat, right, to my students, then I do not let them write anything down until they tell me how many um, phonemes there are because the dots are the phonemes. So they're gonna dot it first and then they're gonna go back and jot in the letters. So if I said bat, then if I see any letters written down, nope, doesn't count, right? And they need to go back and, and just put the dots in. So bat, and I'll say how many and three, I want them usually to hold up fingers because otherwise, yeah, everybody is just copying off each other. Um, then they can go back in and I'll repeat it again. It's not like I'm not gonna tell them what it is. I'll repeat it again and say bat so that they can go back and put the graphemes in, right? The graphemes are the letters that represent the sounds. So now we have B-A-T, right? So the next one, if I said chat and I have my sounds are ch act, they should bubble in three. And then I'll say chat after they tell me how many they have, three, then they have to go back in and go ch at, right? C-H-A-T. And I'll say, well, what do you have? And they'll say in the first box, C-H. What do you have in the second box? A, last box, T, right? Because if I say, what do you have in the first box? So they say, ch. I don't know if they spelled it right, right? So the first, the phonemes were listening for the sound, the graphemes are the second part, okay? So if I said flip, they would put down the number of sounds, full, if, so they're gonna have four, right? Because if you're thinking right now that F and L go into one box, that is not true, right? So FL is a common consonant blend, but they're definitely two different sounds. So they're gonna go in two different boxes. These are sound boxes. So one sound per box um, and sounds can have more than one letter. So it's not about, you know, chat is two letters, but one sound, but the full two sounds that are spelled with one letter each. So we wanna make sure that we have one in each box, right? So, you can start to, the kids can start to see, okay, the first ones, those are one-to-one -one correspondences. Those are pretty easy because I can hear those sounds, you know, as we're moving through, I'm showing you kind of a progression over time. So it depends on how old your students are, but just because a word is one syllable doesn't mean it's necessarily easy. So if you don't want to use bat because your kids are um, older, you can choose wit, you know, get a sharp wit or um, whet your appetite versus, you know, W-H-E-T versus W-E-T. Um, if you want to teach some vocabulary along with it, you can, you can make these harder. But if their skill level is just at CDC, then you can pick harder words that are um, simpler phonetically, right? So meaning and phonics are not necessarily 
um, you know, always hand in hand. If it's CVC, it does not mean it's easy. It could be like this, and it could be the other way. Um, you know, kids know what pterodactyl is. You know, they know tons of dinosaur names, but then spelling is going to be really hard. So you've got these, you know, um, opposites. So you just have to kind of pay attention to what you're, you know, looking to assess and what you're looking to teach at that time. All right. So flip four sounds, four letters. Now I'm going to say shorts. Okay. I have to wear shorts in the summer. So we're going to have sh or t shorts. Right. So we still have four sounds. But that's a lot of letters, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, sh is two letters, one sound, or two letters, one sound, um, and then the T and the S. Um, so this way, kids are saying, okay, we've got, you know, different graphemes, and it's not a letter. You know, when when people do letter of the week, they're doing a huge disservice to kids because there's 44 sounds, right? And we already saw that there's, um, you know, anywhere between depending on you look 80 and 300 um, different correspondent graphemes. Um, and so we wanna make sure that, that we're teaching those, right? If we just go through the alphabet, 26 letters and we're done, that's not even close to what the kids are gonna need to know um, to represent in, in text, right? So the next one is teacher. So teacher, t e ch er. Right, so now we still have four sounds, okay? But wow, seven letters, okay? So when kids are looking at these words, they may not have any more sounds than any other, right? So they need to be teaching this, we need to be teaching them these correspondences, but we also do need to teach them what these things mean because there's, kids will not write words they don't know what they mean, right? So if we have teach and we have er, we can be like er, a person who teaches, and start to give them, you know, some of those morphemes, those units of meaning while we're doing this. But phoneme grapheme mapping is, is perfect for getting your phonemic awareness with your phonics activity, but isolating them so that they're not necessarily like that, memorizing it, writing it down, and then telling you the sounds, right? Um, we want them to stop, think about the sounds, think about how many sounds, go back and put the letters in. Some kids are going to have a hard time with that. They're going to have a hard time remembering what it is that you just said, uh, but all of that is, is diagnostic. So if they can't remember bat to be able to put that down, then you need to start with at, right? We Maybe two is where we need to start. Um, and then once we get two pretty consistently that they can listen for the number of sounds and then put it down, then you can add three, then you can go three, two, three, two, um, and then slowly you know, add in your digraphs and then work up to your blends where you're gonna have more, more sounds, okay? So if the next word, I, I'm still doing dot and jotting when we get into Latin, right? So if I'm, if I say cactus, then it would be cactus, 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 depending on where you live, right? So I pretty much say cactus. Um, and so then they could go and put the sounds down, but I would be doing this when I'm teaching more little bit, you know, different spelling rules, like when to use a C and when to use a K um, and different suffixes, like when to use a U-S and O-U-S. Um, if it's a noun, it's a U-S. If it's an adjective, it's O-U-S. Um, and so you can, you can see that you can use these regardless of how old kids are. Um, I do the, you know, activity, the, the phoneme where I'm cutting and, and dividing them into phonemes, regardless of age. Uh, I do it when I do teacher training and in person. If you took the training online, you didn't get to do it. But in person, we cut things up. You'd be surprised how many of the teachers struggle with it. it sounds easier than it is sometimes. <laughs> so, um, but try it with your students and it gives them like a hands-on, you know, activity to really kind of understand the words. And, and it also makes them think of different words for things. Like if you said, okay, I want you to find a five, you know, sound word versus a four sound word, then they would try to think of another word uh, for an object that might have more sounds in it. And that is a really good vocabulary activity. So this is one of the activities I use. After I, after I teach this, um, I 
you know, give them some things that they can practice um, doing it on. Well, I can't dictate for them all the time. Um, I need some things for them to do. So I have a whole books of smart squares where they would look for the word, like in this case, it's twin. And then they have to go one down and then they have to put one sound per box, right? So if we were doing the word spoon, it would be spoon. So they would have to go two down. The S would be in the first box. The P would be in the second, O, O in the third, and N in the last box. And this way, you know, it's, it kind of, your traditional crossword isn't gonna work because they, they try to count the number of letters, they're never gonna find out where it goes. And so I've had so many kids over the years that are always trying to, you know, count the number of letters. And if they can get the one with eight boxes, they can find one with eight letters and put it across. This totally ruins it for them. <laughs> so it's basically dot and jot in a crossword, um, but I don't tell them that, right? So if they think it's fun and that's good because then they get some practice. So if you're in the click, I'm gonna be including um, a whole bunch of these for you. So, but there are lots of ways that you can, you know, figure out how to, you know, parents dictate words onto a dot and jot. You can tell them um, to dictate to their child four or five words for, I call it home fun. Um, you know, it's better practice than, you know, a lot of the worksheets out there, right? Okay, so this is rhyming, vocabulary, um, phonics, and grammar all can be rolled into one. So uh, I just randomly grabbed a couple images from my um, rhyming searches. And, you know, if I have best, chest, and nest, uh, on this one, I it's from a document that I just drag and drop, but the kids would have to put it into noun, verb, or both, and then, you know, talk about how to use them as both. And so, you know, the word nest is really simple for a young kid if they're gonna use it as a noun, right? I saw a bird make a nest, right? But if you said, you know, these Russian dolls nest one inside another, you know, they're probably not familiar with that term. Or when I stack the bowl, you know, bowls in my cabinet, they all nest within one another. And that is not going to be maybe, you know, a word that, that young kids use, but you can start to show them Okay, best, chest, nest, we're talking about rhyming. Um, it's not a three-year-old skill or a four-year-old skill because now they're reading words with consonant blends at the end and they've gotten through um, you know, the primary phonemes and by the time they're doing ending blends. So now we can go back and make sure that that rhyming is, is still intact because we want them to start hearing the similarities between these words. Because even if you have, you have chest and best, nest, I mean, you could have like rest, like W-R-E-S-T versus R-E-S-T, right? If I'm going to rest, little kids know to take a rest, right? But they may not know that W-R is to, you know, I'm going to rest it out of his hands and twist it and pull it out of his hands. Then, you know, that, you know, they still rhyme, but the level of vocabulary is, is much more difficult. And they're thinking about grammar when they're doing this. You can ask them to use them in a sentence orally, um, you know, if they're not really ready to be using them in writing, or you can, you know, have them, you know, use them in their own writing, but just make sure that you're not counting off for things you haven't taught, okay? So um, I correct kids spelling if they spell things incorrectly, because you don't want the wrong spelling getting into their orthographic memory for the rest of their life. Um, you may have noticed when you started teaching that your spelling deteriorated <laughs> because once I started seeing all these words misspelled all the time, I started to second guess myself because I'm like, wait a second, is that how you spell that? W-U-Z is starting to look like it's right. <laughs> so, but that's because you're used to seeing it all the time. You're like, okay, no, it's not right. Um, but we don't want them to start thinking, okay, that's right, because that's the way I've been writing it for so long that it looks correct. So we can correct it, but we just wouldn't count them off. If it's not something that I've taught, um, I wouldn't give them any points off. Um, you know, if I was asking them to use vest in a sentence, I would give them their points for being able to use it in correctly in a sentence, because that's really what I'm looking for. And then I would, you know, 
correct the spelling if they said I wore a vest to the mall and they spelled spelled war without an e at the end then I might just add the e but I'm not going to say anything about it okay um so this is could be a lower level or a higher level um rhyming vocabulary phonics and grammar activity and mind find is um an activity that um I like to do um, I really like this game a lot um, because it gives kids a lot of practice and um, and because they're playing a game, they're actively engaged and they want to keep playing. But the thing about it is, is that you can do, you can be in teams with kids like you can play one on one. If you're if you're just working with a kid, um, you know, then you can play against your student, right? You can play in small groups, have two small groups against one another or a group of three and a group of three. Um, whole group, I do this a lot in classrooms where I divide down the middle as I'm teaching it and you know we kind of respond chorally and I'll have you know like 15 kids on one side, 15 kids on the other side. I know not everybody is participating every time, but what's happening is they're hearing what kids or other kids are saying. We're still getting the practice in breaking these words down. Um, so, you know, it's, it, you know, some are more, you know, intense if it's smaller group, but if it's a bigger group, it's still okay. Okay, so this is really important step. You have to name your team. So you divide into teams, you name your team. It is very important. If you don't let the kids pick a name, then, you know, you're just never gonna win teacher of the year. <laughs> okay, then you're gonna flip over to sound cards and I'm gonna demonstrate um, how to play this because oftentimes when I explain it, uh, I get a lot of questions like I didn't get it. So I'm going to show you. So we flip over to sound cards, which are the graphemes, and we're and I assign categories. So um, food, animals, science words, nouns. It depends on the, you know, age of the kids. Um, you know, if they're older, I'll be like hip hop recording artists, <laughs> whatever, whatever might appeal to them. Because it doesn't matter. We're not going to spell them. We are just doing a phoneme and vocabulary activity. So um, each team is going to submit a word, then we're going to divide and count the phonemes, and then of course the team with the most points wins. So let me show you how we do that. I have, um, since this is a webinar and I don't know what you know team names you all want, I have decided to go with both of my daughter's colleges. So we're going to do the Bulldogs, Georgia Bulldogs against the Auburn Tigers. Um, and, and so, our Bulldogs are playing against the Tigers. And so I might say, okay, our first category is food. Okay, if I give them, depending on their age, um, a certain amount of time for them to talk amongst themselves and come up with the food that you want to submit as your answer. Um, and, and what they're looking for is not spelling it and not the number of letters, but how many sounds are in the word that they're submitting. So if I flip these over, usually I give like 30 seconds because sometimes there's quite a lot of debate. You know, kids are throwing words out and they get better at it as they go. So I would say, okay, Bulldogs, you have the letter S and the sounds and tigers, you have the letter T and the sound. T. So you get one point per phoneme. So if it was food and let's say the Bulldogs submitted soup, which is a terrible response by the way, um, then we would do it together. We would go soup. Sometimes initially I'm the only one saying the sound <laughs> until they gain confidence. <laughs> but once they start really catching on, I can hear them, you know, just saying all different kinds of words. So like lasagna, you know, like lasagna, they start going through the sounds and they're like spaghetti. <laughs> you know, they can't spell these words, but they're starting to think about what, what words would have more sounds in them, right? Because it doesn't matter if it's English. I've had kids like I say food and they're like enchilada. We can still sound stretch enchilada because we don't need to know Spanish to hear the sounds. And because we can, if we can say the word, then we can, we're hearing the sounds within that word and we can break it down. So soup, terrible, only three points. Um, let's see the tigers, they're gonna do tomato, but one of the other tigers says, ooh, add an S, okay tomatoes. <laughs> Let's make it plural. So now did they add an S? No, we're not dealing in letters, but it's that kids are starting to think about the fact that, oh, 
if I add a suffix, then it's going to be longer. And so this starts to develop on its own. Then they'll be like, oh, I need a prefix. So then it'll be even longer as far as the number of phonemes. And so you don't even have to tell them. It just starts, the ball starts rolling and they start figuring it out. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, you, may, you may need to tell them. So some of my students who really struggle, I'll be like, ooh, maybe you can make that plural. You know, you can get more sounds out of it. Because if they pick tax, you'd be like, ooh, taxes, plural, right? Um, but ours is tomato, so tomatoes. So if we have t, m, a, t, o, s, tomatoes, right? Mine kind of sounds like tomatoes, right? It's more of a z sound at the end because we're coming after a loud sound. Um, so this way, instead of them going, you know, if they're spelling it, they're going to be t, a, m, a, t in their head. So you want them to listen for it because we've got schwa in there, right? And our plural sound doesn't sound like an S, it sounds like a Z. So this is making them aware that there might be, if they know how to spell, they're hearing the sound and it's not quite matching the spelling that they know, right? And so when, we're, when they're doing this, it's making them aware whether they're readers and spellers or not. It's still beneficial because they're starting to see that there is the kind of a disconnect sometimes between the sound that we hear and the letter that we would use. And that's gonna make them better at figuring out um, spelling when they start to realize we have um, you know, alternate sounds, same spelling, schwa, all those fun things. Okay, so if I flip over the next category and we have, or the next sounds and we have m mm and b, I'm gonna say place we visited. Okay, so this is a place we visited. So now if I visited Michigan and I'm a bulldog and I'm gonna go Michigan, then I would, I just usually keep adding on to my um, up to five. So kind of teaching them how to do tick marks, but m, i, sh, i, g, and then Michigan, g, i, n, right? So we have seven sounds in Michigan and they can't make a plural. So there's nothing they can do there. Um, and then the tigers, you said place you visited, they're like bathroom. <laughs> I have some kids that, this is actual true story. I had a kid say bathroom. So other kids were trying to think of Mississippi and Michigan and, um, you know, and other kids were like, I visited the bathroom and it is a place, right? So we could next time differentiate between a proper noun, you know, versus a, a, a location. Right, but if I do bathroom, it would be b, a, b, u, m. Maybe I make it plural. There were two bathrooms. And then we would have extra sounds. So now the tigers beat the bulldogs. Hopefully my kids aren't watching this and I can pretty much guarantee they're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they don't have to worry that the tigers are the winners and my other daughter would be mad. But um, you, what you're doing when you're working on categories is where you're, you're working on pre-writing skills. So name things in categories, right? And that's um, gonna help them think about, you know, writing topics where it's like how many, you know, different kinds of candy bars. Because if I said candy bars, they'd be like, hmm, you know, how many are there? Uh, pretty soon I get to a point where I say, pick a category for the other person and uh, the best category I've ever had a kid pick for the other team was they picked one syllable words. And I thought <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> so I was like, you know, you name a category for them. And then they get mad because they're like, oh, that cat has a lot in that category. And so they're more strategic in what they pick. And it's really good because if kids have to write about a topic, they want to pick about something with a lot of categories in it. Like, um, you know, cats, there's tons of cats, right? There's cats of Africa, domestic cats, cats over 50 pounds, cats under 25 pounds, <laughs> short hair cats, long hair cats, there, right? There's all different kinds. So how do they narrow a topic? Um, and sometimes they pick a topic that's too broad, right? So this is a good way for, for kids to kind of practice thinking about categories without having to actually spell these words. But it doesn't mean that we don't work our way up to that, right? So, and now we could say, you know, we're just talking about the initial sound because I am showing them a letter. And if I'm showing them a letter, then that's phonics. So they know that these things are starting 
you know, most likely with that first letter. Um, and sometimes I give extra credit if there's, you know, more than one of a sound. Um, you know, if it was tomato and they had and they had two t sounds in there, then they would get extra points. Um, so it's really like making them more aware of the same sound paired with that spelling. Um, and sometimes they're not quite right because they'll be like pterodactyl and that's a P, right? So that's silent PT. Um, but it is still, you know, raising their awareness of those phoneme grapheme correspondences. And that's really what we, what we want to happen. Okay, so when you are pairing um, phonics with phonological awareness, try to make sure that you introduce the sound first. You wanna introduce the sound, you wanna activate their prior knowledge, you wanna make sure that they are familiar with the sound and words that have that sound in it, right? Then you can show them the symbol, right? Which is the letter. And a lot of times, because I am a sound first person, when I do trainings, I'll say, you know, you want to do the sound first and talk about the sound and do sound activities. Um, I'll have teachers that say, well, when do you do the letter? I'm like, like 10 minutes later. Like it doesn't have to be that much further away from it because you're really pairing, you want them together, but you want to activate prior knowledge. You want kids to realize what they do know with that sound so that it's easier for them to look at an abstract symbol like a P and a B and, um, you know, just these lines that represent a sound which is invisible right so that's kind of a hard concept for you know at least at least 20 percent of our kids okay? and especially like those bdps and q's so you want to make sure that you're activating prior knowledge and then pairing together with that right if you um if you are taking your letters and the letters are written out um and then you're saying count the sounds that's not nearly as effective as doing it with the dot and jot, where you're gonna say, here are my sounds, I'm gonna put them down. Because I have never had an instance in my entire life when somebody you know, gave me a word, some piece of paper and said, how many sounds in that? <laughs> no one's ever asked me that. But listening for the sounds is gonna help you with spelling, right? Because if you can hear the sound and then transcribe it, that's what encoding is, right? But no one's ever said to me, you know, handed me a piece of paper and said, oh, how many syllables in, in the first sentence? And never, right? How many sounds in the first sentence? No one's ever asked me. So one, one activity is helpful in one direction, you know, way more than it is in the other direction. So that's why traditionally people said, you know, phonological awareness, no letters present at all. And what we're saying now is that we can have a combination of the, of the two, but still lean toward a sound first model. So here's the sound, and then we're gonna pair the letter with it. Okay, so now we're going to have questions and answer. Absolutely, we've got some great questions so far. Okay, so um, I have a couple things for you. So um, one person asked, at what age should we start teaching these skills? Like when is, when is a good time to start working with students? Um, early. I mean, if you're teaching, if you're, if they're five years old, you can even teach just letter, letter awareness and the sounds in, um, preschool. So, but I wouldn't try to get them blending. I wouldn't do CBC, but you could do which ones start with this sound and, and sort pictures and, um, and all of the other phonological awareness, but you can definitely pair a symbol with it because they can handle that. Um, and at least gives them some exposure before they get to kindergarten. But pairing, um, and I, I prefer lowercase, you know, so if kids are preschool age and you're doing lowercase, then they're going to be better prepared for kindergarten. 99% of words on a page are lowercase, but yet we spend, you know, when they're the whole time, they're two, three, and four on uppercase, and then all of a sudden get to school and switch the code on them. So if you're going to, to introduce the letters, still do sound first and talk about sounds and um, you know, look at pictures of things that have sounds in it. And then you can show them what the letter is. But you can absolutely do that, you know, like four years old, as long as you're not asking them to blend. Because kids working memories are not usually developed enough at four years old to sound out that. You know, so just be careful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Um, 
One person asked, what should we do if we have older learners still struggling with phonemic awareness? Can these activities still be applied to more? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so the, the thing that I just did with MindFind, because I call it MindFind, is you have to go into your head and find information. Um, you can pick categories that they would want to hear, you know, and, you know, you can even say, what's, you know, fa favorite songs, and they count the sounds out in, in the, in the whole word, in the whole sentence, right? Because, you know, they're really, you know, up on their music or favorite movie or whatever it is, but then they're, they have to listen to each sound in the word and count them off and say movie title, you know, and, and which one's longer, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of long movie titles. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can do that. And then even the the pictures where I had them cut them, I had them do multisyllabic words. Like it has to be four syllables. Um, you know, it has to, you know, have an adjective. You have to be able to use an adjective that is two syllables with a word that is three syllables. Like I just make it, make them think about it so that it's a, you know, sparkling chandelier, right? So they have to try to think about whatever, you know, criteria I give them um, and they have to communicate it. But if they don't have to spell it because a lot of my older kids can't spell, but their vocabulary also, you know, could use to be developed or it is pretty good. And I can start to raise that awareness and how they're gonna be pairing those together. So yeah, it doesn't matter how old they are. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you recommend, if you're just talking about sound level, do you recommend with older students talking about other ways they might see the sound? Like for example, the sound talking about how it can appear with pH, is that something that would be helpful to kind of layer? Well, yeah, it depends on, it depends on where they are. Like if they're really not reading, <laughs> I'm not gonna jump to pH. So a pH, um, I usually teach just one sound spelling at a time. Um, I don't say here are all the ways you could spell E because there's a lot of those. I start with one way, then I go on to another way to spell I, another way, you know, E, and then I'll eventually loop back and tell them a second way to spell E, but I try to give them the reasons why. Um, I don't, um, PH as an alternate spelling will only occur in Greek. So just teaching PH says F is kind of only half a lesson. I would say PH says F when it's in a base, like a morpheme, like bone means sound, right? And anytime you have a pH, like in graph, which means writing, you're, it's going to say, so just teaching it as a sound by itself is, is kind of a waste. Why not teach it with the meaning? Or at least the most common ones that you're going to see, because you're never going to see a pH that is not in a Greek base, unless somebody made up the word. <laughs> So. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, and if you're if you're a morphology nut, like I know I am wordplay, there's a lot more in there of kind of those fun, those fun tidbits. Okay. Um, so can these activities be used with whole classrooms, small groups, one-on-one? -on -one? Um, yes, all of them can be done every way. Um so every in every activity that I do, it's you can do it whole group, small group, one-on-one. -on -one. And I've done it, you know, in a boat with a goat in the moat. I don't know. But um, I mean, you know, because <laughs> we've done, we do a lot of um, interventions at schools. We set up um, literacy labs. And uh, so sometimes we've got small groups of three. Sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one, sometimes it's the whole class. And we use the same activities. We just modify them uh, accordingly. You know, so we had teams instead of individual. And sometimes it's better because if you have one-on-one -on -one and you're working with a kid that's more severe, they might have difficulty retrieving vocabulary, difficulty retrieving sounds. So, you know, in those kind of game activities, it's good for them to hear their friends maybe come up with a word. So that at that point, they're learning that word too. And, and then they can participate in the segmenting of it. Um, but it helps some of our kids that are, you know, a little bit slower retrievers or don't have as good a vocabulary. They get to hear from other kids. Um, so doing it whole group, I don't think is a, is a problem at all. I think it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it's a nice way to, to connect in the classroom as well. You know, if there's a category that all of the kids really like, if they're, I don't know, some video they saw on TikTok, they can all kind of connect about the same thing <laughs> 
Um, I know in, in another webinar, you talked about even color names. You know, some kids may not be exposed to turquoise or magenta. So even talking about something like colors can really build their oral vocabulary. Absolutely. Awesome. So we got lots of questions about the dot and jot sheet. Um, so you will, will you talk about whether that's being included, et cetera? I'll kind of pick on a few um, questions. I send the dot and jot sheet. Um, it is in the click. So the click you'll have, you'll get the dot and jot sheet. You'll get um, a kindergarten version, a smaller version like that. Like a kindergarten version has lines in the box so that and it's much bigger. So if they you know, can fit it into the little container. So we have one that's for like older kids that has 10 boxes across and then one that's four boxes um, and kindergarten that's really tall. So yeah, that's definitely in um, in the, the clicks. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. I know we go a little bit more in depth to specific types of sounds or spellings in some of our larger trainings, but it's a really great way to get kids mapping and we'll definitely cover that information during the click. Um, I had at least one person ask, so it's a separate interactive session. We're just going to go more in depth into this topic and everyone that attends will get downloadable materials. So some of the fun things that you said. And the one that we're doing on on um, November 11th, that is a lot about mapping. And it's it's like how to sort um, sight words, how to map irregular words, um, you know, how to how to break them down for what kids know and what they don't know. And that's a full day. Um, and it also includes like homophones because people are always like, what about meat and meat? <laughs> uh, so it has homophone activities that go in that, in that too. And that one is, because even when I do like my, you know, full training, part one training, there's only so much, you know, there's a lot of content. There's only so much you can get to. So this one is, I've been, you know, kind of dying for a while to get more in depth into, into the sight words. So that's what that is going to be. And so they'll all be mapped for you and all that stuff is, is, is done. Um, and I just opened it up and started scrolling through and I see people are asking like, what would you do about mapping different things like a silent E and um, yeah, I have those all mapped. So, so <laughs> um, a silent E would go in, if I have cape, it would be cape and the P and the E would go in that last box. Um, so it just, you know, kind of depends. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so some more questions for you. Um, especially with young ends, um, would it be helpful to layer multiple phonemic awareness activities onto a lesson? Like, is it recommended to kind of up how much phonemic awareness you're you're including? Well, um, for the little ones, I would say get at least one activity down <laughs> before you start switching it up. For my older kids, I kind of look at it like, you know, in every lesson, I call it a menu that, you know, in every lesson you have to have your appetizer and your main course and your vegetable and your dessert. Um, and so that you have your phonemic awareness and your phonics and vocabulary and all the things that you need in the lesson. But sometimes I prefer like the appetizer sampler platter. <laughs> so I might do, you know, three of one activity or four of another activity and to just to kind of mix it up if my kids have short attention spans or um, might be a little older and, um, you know, or I make the, the categories harder and there's a competition. Uh, even the, you know, where I have them cut them out and slide in and put them into, you know, sounds, I'll have a race. Like you have so much time and then whoever gets the most in this amount of time and they're all right. And then, so I say time, they've got all their, as many done as they can. And then we go over them and everyone's paying attention because they want to win. So the person who did it wrong, um, you know, they got one disqualified. So they had 15, but now they have 14. So it keeps kids paying attention because kids are naturally competitive. Um, and so when they're older, they like, you know, kind of races and uh, competition. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried doing this really you know, where they had to cut it out and uh, they were in first grade and we we're doing relays. And then I realized, wait, scissors running, bad idea. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, we're not, we're not running on this anymore because they weren't supposed to run with the scissors, <laughs> but they got too excited. And I was like, uh, no, can't have anyone impaled during my lesson. So, so no, far I have a survival rate in my life. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we got a few questions also about the card game that you showed. Um, so someone asked if you could modify it. So rather than 
the target sound being the first sound, can you have them listen for the sound in other parts of the word? Yes, but that, and I, and I kind of mentioned like, I sometimes I'll say you get extra points or you can double your points if the sound is in there more than once, you know, so, um, you know, if you had, you know, three T's like t sound in there, then um, you could triple your points or whatever. Um, and so that the kids get kind of excited about thinking about those words. And I've had kids come in going, okay, I'm ready. I've been thinking about <laughs> words with different sounds in it. And I was like, that's awesome. I've gotten so embedded into their brain that they're thinking about it when they're not in class. I'm like, that's what I was going for. Um, so yeah, so it just, um, you know. You can layer it as much as you need to. Yeah, I know, especially with, um, I know for some students with plural words, like once you kind of reveal that some plural words end in the z sound, they're like, oh, computers, doors, like they get really right. excited about how much you can, how much you can discover. Right. Cool. So, I mean, I get very excited about zebras because then they got double <laughs> and it's two z sound, one at the beginning and at the end. And, um, and it's interesting because the kids that realize they're different spellings, they're like really proud of themselves. And then the other kids just like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I hear it. <laughs> so it's, it's just, you know, it can be pretty engaging and fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So we had some folks ask about using this online versus in person? Um, I know the answer, but I'd love to ask, can these materials be used with kids in person and um, online? Yeah, like the screenshots that I that I took, I have, you know, I sort the, you know, the sound cards, you know, I have them in real life. Actually, I have them sitting right here. So like I have them in real life and we can sort them. And then that was a screenshot from pulling them onto the balloons on a digital format. So virtually anything that I do, you can do, you know, online or in person, um, you know, especially like what I just did with the teams, you could easily do that and you have to kind of rotate through and, or they could go off into their breakout room and they have to think of as many as they can and then come back. And so it just depends on their age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I see somebody said like, what is my take on inventive spelling? Okay, so my definition of inventive spelling is different than some, right? So if a child has not learned sound symbol relationship, why are you making them spell? That's my opinion. Now, if it's the beginning of kindergarten and they don't know any letters and they're just making zigzags and houses and circles, I, I think that's not productive. Um, if I was learning Arabic and I had not learned any symbols and my Arabic professor was like, well, just inventively spell, why? <laughs> then they'd ask me what my scribbles were and I'd be like, I had a cupcake, <laughs> you know, like why would, that just makes no sense. But once they've learned, you know, some sound symbol correspondence, I consider inventive spelling to be, they wanna spell grocery and they spell, you know, G-R-O-S-H, you know, R-E-E -E or something like that. Like, that's pretty good. You know, that it's not necessarily correct, but it has, you know, most of the phonemes in there and the phonemes might be the wrong ones. Like it might be like, I got a phone and they spell it with an F. I'd be happy with that as long as they hadn't learned, you know, the correct spelling. So that's what I consider inventive spelling is more what I, I think should be called phonetic spelling because I don't see why we are making kids try to write when they haven't been taught. It would make no sense in any other language. I mean, imagine if you were like, you know, it's your first day of Mandarin and they're like, well, just invent, <laughs> you know, that would be so, so weird. <laughs> um, but we do it to kindergartners all the time, you know, journal for 15 minutes. I think the teachers just want to drink their coffee. <laughs> I don't know why they're doing it. <laughs> Because then they send it home, like my kids brought it home, and I was like, I don't know what that says, and I don't know what the picture is. <laughs> I'm just being set up here. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay. All right. We have lots of great questions in here. I'm just trying to make sure I get to a lot. A lot. So, some asked about the smart squares. It is my product. Like, I made them all. Um, I am actually considering selling them. So I have not for 18 years, but um, I'm going to be putting them into an activity book soon. Um, those of you who are 
coming to the click will get them digitally, but I haven't made them into an actual, well, I have them in an actual physical book, but it's only previously been for schools. And I'm, I'm thinking about doing it now, putting them as a, on my store. But I haven't done it in the past because, you know, it was interesting. I read, um, I got an article today that said, the new way of teaching spelling, and it was phoneme graphing mapping. And I'm like, I've been doing this for like 30 years. <laughs> So I, have, I didn't really distribute those squares because nobody knew what phoneme graphing mapping was. They would have returned the book and said, there's not enough boxes. <laughs> so, um, so I've only really given it to people I've trained. So we'll see. They're great. They're from experience, the kids, the kids really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, okay, we had some questions also about um, how you continue to research, you know, how you stay up to date. So maybe if you want to tell us one or two things you looked at. Um, yes, so I can um, share, I'll share the research that I was looking at for tonight's webinar with everybody. I can give it to you, Emma, and, um, and then when you get that, you'll see all the journals attached to what those journals are. But, um, you know, you can follow um, research and you can subscribe to it. You can get good research from becoming a member of the Reading League or the International Dyslexia Association, and they'll distribute um you know, information. Sometimes the research articles are a little dry, but the those two organizations kind of, uh, you know, tailor it to teachers so that it's more digestible. I like reading the research and this is why, because sometimes they'll say this works better than this. And when you actually look at the uh, design of the lesson um, in the specifics, it it's not, you know, it's not, it's not for a very long time. Um, it's not, they don't tell you how they did it or the words they used or how it was. And then I have a very hard time really putting a lot of stock in that when I don't know how much repetition they were given, how much training the person got. So, you know, there's a lot of times in the research to me is really not great because, because the delivery system as an educator is what I need to see. How was it delivered? How frequently was it delivered? What were the size of the groups? You know, what were the you know criteria um, to be in the group? Uh, all of that stuff, to me, makes it more valid um, because otherwise you're just kind of believing the summary that you know, we don't really know why. Even though there's a lot of research where I just like the summary, like that research that says, you know, drinking one glass of wine is the same as working out. That's still my favorite research. <laughs> I have not delved any deeper <laughs> into that research because <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> so I'm like, if drinking one glass of wine is like working out some nights, I might work out twice. <laughs> but I do think sometimes people pick and choose what they like about the research. So I, I think digging into it um, before you jump on a bandwagon is, is important for kids. So if you ever have any questions or want some links to some articles, I mean, I can supply um some or help you find some good resources so that you can reach out mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i know uh it, it's great to be always kind of actively involved in the community and there's a there's a lot to a lot to find so we definitely appreciate you sharing those resources um can you talk a little bit i know you did just slightly during your presentation um why it's important to to introduce the sound before the letter okay so the thing, the thing about the sound before the letter is one, there are 44 sounds and lots of ways to spell them, right? So if we can hear the sound and identify the sound, then we can start thinking about which way we're going to spell it. And the reality is, is that it's not just phoneme, grapheme, right? There, morpheme is, is really important. So if I, if I know that, you know, I can hear the sound in a word, right? So it's like, red, rich, run, um, then I'm going to, you know, maybe use the consonant R, right? But if I also hear R and wrench, but I know that there's WR and it means to twist and then a wrench twist, then I can now hear the sounds, which is why let's introduce the sound first, because if we do letter first and I need to spell, well, how is that going to help me? If I'm like, oh, okay, wrench, it could be an R or WR, I'm going to guess. But if, if I say, okay, here's the sound in the beginning and I learned the first one, then I say, okay, remember that sound we learned? Now, 
If it has to do with twisting, then it could be WR. So the sound is still one, there's one sound, right? But then we've got hundreds of graphemes. So if we learned, you know, the sound A, well, you know, like, I don't know, 89% of the time, the A sound is gonna be spelled with an A, like baby, right? So if I know that, then I don't have to be freaked out about E-I-G-H or A-I-G-H, like straight. The word straight, that's the only word with A-I-G-H. So why would I teach that with the same amount of emphasis as an A by itself um, in the open syllable? I, I shouldn't. So, you know, that's why if you have, you know, 44 sounds, that's like saying here are your, fam your families at a reunion and you know, all the Smiths have red hair and all the Johnsons have brown hair and all the whatever, you know. Um, it's easier to attach things to that than it is to um, have everybody's name at the reunion and not know which family they belong to. Um, you know, and then there are some of them where you're like, okay, this, this guy, I see him all the time. The other guy, he just flew in for the reunion. I'm never seeing him again. So which one should I should I should I memorize? <laughs> which one should I should I use first? Right? If I run into a, a Smith and I had to pick a name, I'm going to pick the most frequent one, the one that I've probably run into the most. So it's really just a better way to organize it, you know, to reduce cognitive load. Um, and that and that's also kids speak first. They don't, you know, they don't spell first. So if they can produce these sounds and then they're aware that that's the sound they're producing and you could raise their awareness on where the sound is in their mouth, then you're, you're giving them lots of things to anchor to that they already know. And in education, we are told, taught this over and over and over again, activate prior knowledge. And you activate prior knowledge, we know this because in your hippocampus is your prior knowledge. Anything that you're learning has to go through all these all this place, all these places to get in there and stick. And so if we have something for it to attach to, it's more likely to stay, go into your long-term memory than if it's just this random fact out here that you don't have anything to attach to. So that's why if you can attach it to um, sound first, your mouth movement, you know, how to feel the difference between the sounds, if there's any way to attach it to, to meaning, you know, all of these different connections we have that we can, we're going to have more connections in our brain and, and a better access to that information. So that is um, why I'm sound first person. No, it's great to hear. I know it's it's always a goal to, to increase retention and reduce cognitive load. I know that's something you'll talk about more in this upcoming high frequency training as well, you know, you know effectively teaching words so there, there's less to memorize overall. Um, we did get a few questions about that training. If you wanna talk about kind of the difference or what you're, what you're diving into as well, that would be cool. Between what this week um, and this week in the high frequency training in uh, November. Yeah. yeah, this this one is um, high frequency is just high frequency words. Um, how to sort them, how to distinguish them. Those are you know high frequency words are all well not all but mostly Anglo-Saxon Old English. Um, so a lot of your irregular words and and smaller you know families of of things. So that's that's kind of a little bit different. This one is. It could be anything like I had a vampire, you know, on there and we're saying like mm -hmm, vampire and we can, um, you know, a vacuum. Vacuum is actually a, a pretty complicated word, right? Because V-A-C, right? So which is like out, just, you know, suck out. And then U-M, it's actually vacuum because U is the connector and U-M is the suffix. But over time, probably traveling salesmen didn't know how to say it. So I don't know. But um, it's like vacuum. But it's like continuum, it should be vacuum. Um, but you know, if you're if it's out, like your the vacuum is sucking all the air out or whatever. But uh, that's not a, a real easy word for spelling, but it is a word we can use for vocabulary and still look at the V and talk about the V and that it starts with the sound that we represent with a V. Um, so I think that's um, you know a good thing. Because they're different things. Like one is like highly frequent, and you're probably in your oral vocabulary, but you don't know how to spell it because you're like bought. I don't know. <laughs> <One. laughs> easy, easy way to to learn how to spell bought, right? So bought and thought, totally phonetic. Mm -hmm. People don't. Know. So. <laughs>
but it is laugh totally phonetic um but it just you know phonetic is totally varies on what you've taught so if you have not taught um sound spelling correspondence for the sounds in laugh then it's not phonetic so so people are always talking about is this an irregular word or not most words are not irregular they're just less frequent and you haven't taught that phoneme graphene correspondence yet. So almost everything, you know, has a reason. It's just, have you taught it yet? And that's what the irregular part of a word is. I have not taught that yet. So. Oh, that's really helpful. No, that's great. But this week we'll kind of dive into the activities that you show. There's a lot more activities that she's going to be talking about. And then that next training is really focusing on high frequency words. Uh, Okay. Yes, totally different thing. Um, somebody says that they're your game, that you're their game guru. So nice. Oh. <laughs> Do you mind saying the name of that card game again? I know that was also a question that was asked. Um, oh, this one, this is good quest. So this is like, I use this for a lot of my phonics games. It's got all the consonants and all the vowels. Um, I shouldn't say it all, but a lot. And um, at least the 44 and more. <laughs> Um, but not 280. Uh, so the um, so I use it for a lot of different things that I that I do mix between phonics and and phonemic awareness. Gotcha, gotcha, absolutely. Um, okay, let's see what else do we have. Um, can you? Someone asked if I have sorting slides for sale. I don't, but I am giving them to people in the click. So. Um, I have so many things that I don't sell, which honestly, it's not very smart. Um, but <laughs> there's a reason I'm not rich. Um, I also didn't think Starbucks would take off either. So <laughs> when Starbucks opened, I'm like, who wants coffee in Georgia in the summer? Apparently everyone. Um, but uh, I didn't think the internet would take off either. So. Obviously, I'm not going to be a billionaire, but we're giving all that stuff for people um, in the clicks, and um, maybe someday I'll put them on our on our store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you recommend incorporating movement into these activities? Like, if you did the sorting cards, and you know the word vampire comes up, it's October. Do you want kids to act like they're a vampire? Like, can you kind of layer in some some more physical components? Well, I always, I always want the kids to, to move if they can. So even if I like hold up a card and say, does this start with a, you know, a, or a, I'll say go that way if it's a, that way if it's a, if I'm on, you know, so at least they're moving. I mean, nobody wants to sit still um, and listen to somebody ramble like me for an hour. Um, you know, your brain just kind of starts to shut down. So if you can get them jump up, if it's an F sound and, touch your toes if it's a sound great you know I don't have any problem with that um you know I've had kids where you know I just make them run and touch that wall run and touch that wall you know if it's this or that because when they come back I've had enough time to flip to the next things <laughs> and if they were sitting there they probably would have messed with my stuff or broken my crayons because <laughs> there's some squirmy little guys out there right uh, so yeah but I think everybody appreciates moving so yeah I, I'm a big fan I know kids like it, especially, especially I actually because like I'm bored too. Like, I don't want to just drone on and on, you know, it's, it's so it's, it makes it more exciting. And, and they also usually beat me because they're faster than me. And um, I might know the phonics better, but they have better reflexes. So they end up beating me and that makes them very happy. So um, don't be afraid to jump in and, and have fun with them. Mm -hmm. And tire them out a little bit. That's why it's going to hurt. Best, Emma. Mm -hmm. Emma is like crazy active. Like I can't even, I, I join in, but she exhausts me, but not the kids. They're like <laughs> totally with it. <laughs> the difference between 50 and 25. I don't know. You're older than that. I don't worry. But, uh, <laughs> I'll take 25. <laughs> I'll take 50 because I'm older than 50. So <laughs> I just made my math. So whatever works. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's so fun. All right. I'm trying to see if there are any remaining questions we can get to as we have our last, our last five minutes. You want to look through the list? Like the ink and the ang and ank and 
Um, that those are like fighting words because people get very like dug in on those. But um, you know, you know, it's it's co-articulation and ng is one sound. So you know, if I have you know ing, it's two sounds, and um, you know, ink is going to be three sounds. Um, so it's just the way that it is. But a lot of people want to try to say they're one sound, which they aren't. But if you learn that way, I just wouldn't map them. So I would recommend that if you are really like freaking out over I-N, any of the INKs, ANKs, ANGs, go to wordfinder.com, type in words that end in ANK. There's like five, I don't even know, maybe six. It is not worth getting upset about, right? So um, there are some you know things that I see these debates all the time in, in some of the like Facebook groups and stuff. And I'm like, there's five words, move on, <laughs> you know, with that pattern. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, if I think about how much time I have with the kid, if I am in a classroom, there's 180 days in the year. Um, and the whole time I was in the schools, I would kind of calculate how many days I really got. Uh, and I'd say about 130 hours total because you're going to get, like, if you have, say you're lucky enough to get an hour a day, um, you still have like attendance and people coming in and out and picture day and sickness and whatever. So I treat every year as if I have 130 hours. And so what do I want to get through and be able to master? I'm not going to waste my time on three words. I'm just not, because it's not worth my 130 hours. So if I said at the end of this year, what do I want them to leave with? I can probably pick something more important than the spelling of, you know, a couple words that they're going to probably memorize just by being alive, you know, because they're so frequent and they're, so I just move on. Makes sense. Honestly, the homophones are, are often a lot, a lot trickier for students. So nice to spend some time on those. Okay. I'm just looking at any remaining questions. I posted the link to the click and to our YouTube page and to our Facebook page if you want to find any resources. Um, we've got a lot of great things online for free. Um, so please, please feel free to look at those. Uh, I think that's it, Jennifer. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. I know we got a lot of information out of it. It was super. Yeah. Cool. It was fun. All right. And I'll, I'll um, you know, we'll try to get everything out by the end of the day tomorrow for today. Do you think it'll be end of day tomorrow? Okay. Well, so please be patient. Be yeah. patient. Don't email us nonstop till maybe give us a day after tomorrow. We got a lot of people going, haven't got it yet. Haven't got it yet. Um, but we'll make sure that it takes time to compress. It takes a while to, to turn into a video that we can send to you. So probably like seven or eight hours. Um, so maybe give us to the day after tomorrow and then you'll have your certificate and, and everything else. All right. Okay. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you.